Today is a very special day because we're diving into some important results from analytic number theory. And it all starts with the Dirichlet eta function defined by this equation for complex numbers s having real part greater than zero. So let me just expand the infinite series on the right hand side. And I can write this as 1 by 1 to the s minus 1 by 2 to the s plus 1 by 3 to the s minus 1 by 4 to the s and so on and so forth. Also, we can write this as 1 to the negative s minus 2 to the negative s plus 3 to the negative s minus 4 to the negative s and so on and so forth. So this is the eta function. But what I'm interested in is a derivative of this very special function. So we differentiate with respect to the s parameter, giving me eta prime s on the left hand side, and on the right, I'm gonna get one to the negative s times log one, and because of the chain rule, I have a negative sign here. So all the signs are flipped. I now have plus two to the negative s log two, minus three to the negative s log three, plus four to the negative s log four, and of course log one is zero, so I can get rid of this term. And let me just move this a bit and write one more term here, minus five to the negative s times log five, and so on and so forth. We can now make use of the properties of the logarithm to simplify the right-hand side and make it look a lot more compact. So all the coefficients turn into exponents of the argument, and on the right-hand side, we have log two to the two to the negative s, minus log three to the three to the negative s, plus log four to the four to the negative s, minus log five to the five to the negative s, and on and on we go. And notice we have these differences of logarithms that can be combined into a single logarithm, where the argument is a fraction of the two arguments, of the two separate arguments. And we have those logarithms being added together. That means we can multiply the arguments. Okay, so that means I have log two to the two to the negative s divided by three to the three to the negative s. That's this thing taken care of. And now I also had four to the four to the negative s divided by five to the five to the negative s, and these two are being multiplied. Similarly, I'm gonna have six to the six to the negative s by seven to the seven to the negative s, and so on and so forth. So this is what the derivative of the eta function looks like in terms of a logarithm. And exponentiating gives me e to the eta prime of s equal to two to the two to the negative s, by three to the three to the negative s, wait a minute, much better, times four to the four to the negative s, by five to the five to the negative s, times six to the six to the negative s, by seven to the seven to the negative s, and on and on we go. Now, the result I'm trying to derive is the derivative of the eta function at s equal to zero. So plugging in s equal to zero gives me e to the eta prime at zero equal to, now all the exponents here turn into something to the zero, which we know to be one. So that means we have an infinite product of even numbers divided by an infinite product of odd numbers, which is pretty cool if I square everything because squaring everything gives me the Wallace product for pi by two. So all of this implies that e to the two times eta prime at zero equals pi by two, which is beautiful. And using logarithms, we can isolate the derivative term here. So that means we have two times eta prime at zero equal to, terribly sorry about that, again, terribly sorry, equal to log pi by two which implies that the derivative of the eta function at zero equals one half of the logarithm of pi by two, which is just beautiful. Okay, now what about the derivative of the zeta function at zero? Well, it's time to reference the beautiful functional equation that relates the eta and zeta functions. 
which is eta s equals one minus two to the one minus s times zeta s. So we know what the derivative of the eta function at zero is. So let's just differentiate this and solve for zeta prime s at zero. So I have on the left-hand side, eta prime s equal to applying the product rule gives me one minus two to the one minus s times zeta prime s. And I have a plus sign. The way this would be a uh, couple extra negative signs canceling out. So that gives me two to the one minus s times log two times zeta s. And we're interested in the case of s being equal to zero, right? So that means we have eta prime at zero equal to one minus two to the one minus zero, that's two. So I have negative one here, negative zeta prime s plus again two times log two times zeta zero. So what exactly is zeta zero? Well, that's an interesting exercise in itself because it makes use of the zeta function's awesome functional equation as well as the functional equation for the gamma function and residues. Yeah, I know that sounds like a lot, but trust me, it's pretty easy in this case. So we know that the zeta function is given by an infinite series for complex numbers having real part greater than 1. We know that for s equal to 1, we have a simple pull for the zeta function. And for the rest of the complex plane, we have this really nice functional equation that is zeta s equal to 2 to the s times pi to the s minus 1 times sine of pi by 2 times s times gamma 1 minus s times zeta 1 minus s. Wow, that is one hell of an equation. Anyway, we need to calculate zeta zero. So one option could be plugging in s equal to zero, and that would give me zeta zero on the left, or I could make use of s equal to one, which would give me zeta zero on the right. The problem is, because of the structure of this equation, that would give me zeta ones. Both these cases, both these values of s, would give me zeta ones on either side of the equation, which is of course, a no-go because, like I said, the zeta function has a singularity there. Also, for the s equal to 1 case, we have the gamma function having a singularity at s equal to 0. Okay, that is another problem. But there's a nice way to work around this by multiplying the whole equation by 1 minus s. And what good does that do? Well, we have 1 minus s times zeta s equal to 2 to the s times pi to the s minus 1 times sine of pi by 2 times s. And where's that 1 minus s term on the right-hand side? Well, we have 1 minus s times gamma 1 minus s, which as per the functional equation for the gamma function is gamma 1 plus 1 minus s. So we have gamma 2 minus s. Okay, great. And like I said, it has a singularity. It has a simple pole at s equal at the argument equal to zero. And in this case, with the gamma two minus s thing, we're safe from that. And we have this zeta one minus s term at the end. Now I'm interested in a limiting case here, but first let me just replace this s minus 1, this at 1 minus s term by an s minus 1 and introduce an extra negative sign. And I'm interested in the limit as s approaches 1. That gives me on the left hand side the negative of the residue of the zeta function at s equal to 1. And on the right I have 2 to the 1 which is 2, pi to the 0 which is 1, sine of pi by 2 is again 1. Gamma 1 is also 1, so I have 2 times zeta 0. And how do we figure out the residue of the zeta function at s equal to 1? Well, like I said, it has a simple pole there. And we can evaluate it using the Leroy series expansion of the zeta function that I derived as part of the solution development of the previous integral. Link in the description below. The integral was extremely awesome. So zeta s 
the Leroy series expansion around s equal to 1 is 1 by s minus 1 plus the Euler Mascheroni constant plus a bunch of terms of order s minus 1 and above. So multiplying by s minus 1 gives me s minus 1 times zeta s equal to 1 plus Euler Mascheroni plus s minus 1 times all those terms. And in the limit, as s tends to 1, we have s minus 1 times zeta s, which is the residue of the zeta function at s equal to 1, giving me, wait, I forgot to multiply this by s minus 1, terribly sorry about that. So this crashes to zero, and so does all of this stuff, and we have the residue equal to one, which is quite beautiful indeed. The residue of the wonderful Riemann zeta function equaling one. Wow. And this implies that zeta zero equals negative one half. Again, beautiful. We now have all the ingredients necessary to calculate the target case, that is, zeta prime at zero. On the left, we have eta prime zero, which we derive to be one half of log pi by two. On the right, we have negative target case, which is zeta prime at zero plus two times log two times zeta zero, which is negative one half. We have some cancellation taking place, which implies that zeta prime at zero equals negative log two minus log root pi by two. Okay, so factoring out the negative sign, I now have the logarithm of a product, which is root pi by root two times two. So we have negative two divided by root pi, uh, root two is root two. So we have negative log root two pi. And again, the properties of the logarithm mean that zeta prime at zero equals log one by root two pi. Again, a beautiful result. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.